All right, so speaking five languages and giving another causal inference talk, which is incredibly popular, popular these days. There's a reason we schedule two of them because it's a hot topic. Please welcome Camilla. But this is the last talk of the day, so hopefully I'll make this talk as uh, relevant and fun as possible. So my name is Camilla, and I'm a data scientist at Code Academy. And today we'll go over industry applications of causal inference methods. Um, so specifically, these are causal inference methods um, that are very prevalent in observational studies and that I've leveraged in my previous experience uh, when A-B testing was just not on the table. Um, we have a very, very packed agenda, but I will try to make this as, uh, as exciting as possible. So I'll give a very high level overview why well in general uh, companies, tech companies do love A-B testing. I won't spend too much time since I know in the past um, talks there has, been, uh, there has been a good amount of information on this topic. Um, I'll give an example of, a, uh, of an A-B test that we ran at Code Academy, um, followed by some uh, limitations of A-B testing. So limitations and constraints, and that's really going to be the foundation of the uh, second, half of our, second half of our talk. And the most important part of our talk, which uh, I call quasi-experimental methods for the win. And so specifically, we'll be designing an experiment for a safety product together. I'll explain later what a safety product is. Um, we'll be applying, so the quasi-experimental method that we'll be focusing on is differences and differences. So we'll apply that in our quasi-experiment and we'll compute the average treatment effect in R. Uh, if we have enough time, we'll discuss an additional method, a uh, surprise additional method. Uh, my team told me to end at diff and diff, but uh, it's 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 a very it's a great method. So if we have time, I'll, I'll go over it. Um, so cool, a gold standard for experimentation: A/B testing. So at a very high level, um, an A/B test is just a perfectly randomized and controlled experiment used to infer uh, causality. And so essentially, with your treatment, um, you can estimate the causal impact on your outcome. And um, it's a very iterative and straightforward technique. And it's used to measure the effectiveness of product changes and feature launches um, you know, at a very simplistic level. Let's say you have two different designs. You don't necessarily how it, know how it's going to impact your user behavior. You have a very clear hypothesis. Um, and your, your, your variant is pretty straightforward. Um, and you have the infrastructure to go ahead and randomize. Um, then you can just use a difference in means, uh, hypo difference in means test uh, to measure that incremental lift. And so an example of that um, is a okay is, is what we ran recently at Code Academy. So what you see here is your learning environment. So for those of you who have uh, never logged in or gone on Code Academy, I, I highly recommend it. It's an excellent learning platform. Um, our developers really like curate this content with care. Um, and so here, what you'll see is that I'm I'm learning I'm learning JavaScript, and in the lower bottom, the bottom right. <laughs> uh, Part of the of the screen, you see this get help, and really, um, get help is just like if you were to click it, it would bring you to a, a bunch of like supplemental uh, material on um, cheat sheets, discussion forums. It really is supposed to help all of the learning. It's just additional learning content. Um, but after running a bunch of user interviews, we saw that actually users uh, thought that it was a link to our customer support, so they were not necessarily clicking on it and not unfortunately not getting access to this great learning material. So what we decided to do with a fellow engineer is, well, let's just go run a simple A-B test, right? So it's a very simple front end change. And essentially what you're doing is you're changing your, um, essentially you're introducing, you're changing your treatment and your variant here is going from get help to get unstuck. And your, your hypothesis is that you're essentially going to be able to see an increase in, in click through rate. And so that's what, what we were able to develop. Um, that's as simple as it gets in terms of A-B testing. If you are able to be in an environment where you can replicate this type of test, it's a great way to infer causality. Um, unfortunately, it's not very often the case. And so we'll go over um, the limitations and constraints. And so first and foremost, a lot of the times randomization is not possible. So either uh, because you don't have the engineering and infrastructure comp uh, complexities or capabilities, um, and another of the times you could be in a very, let's say, highly regulated industry, right? Let's say you are in finance, you're in transportation, ride share. You have a little bit, like as a data scientist, like less flexibility on who you can assign treatment and control, and sometimes you're, you can't even randomize, right? So you need to be able to leverage additional tools. 
Second of all, um, really A-B testing ignores a lot of these confounding factors or like noise that happens prior to your intervention. So a lot of pre-existing differences, um, such as like selection or participation bias, uh, wouldn't necessarily be taken into account uh, when looking at your outcome or your differences in outcome. And so essentially what you need to be able to do is to kind of leverage uh, here what we're going to call quasi-experimental methods um, to be able to estimate your treatment effect. And that's really what we're going to be doing in this, in this big meat of the talk. So a few caveats here. Um, I will really be focusing on uh, industry applications, right? This is not a theoretical course. I will not be reproving any of these methods. But I want to go over some examples um, that I think are very valuable. Um, in, in a different industry, right? Um, so a little bit of background about me. Prior to Code Academy, I was data scientist at Uber um, on the safety team. And so as you can imagine, like Uber is just like way more of a regulated space. Um, regulated, I, I'm, saying, I'm using this term very loosely, but essentially like you're building products and models um, that are directly impacting people's lives, right? Riders, drivers, couriers. So you need to be very sensitive on what you decide to launch. On top of that, being on the safety team, you're really just trying to like build out products that ensure the safety of your of your users. Um, but the additional constraint here is that you have to take into consideration marketplace effects. Uh, so essentially, like yes, it's great you want to keep your your user safety, and that is our P zero. But um, a lot of the times, you need to think about things like ETA, pricing, trips, etc. So you're in a way more uh, constrained and complex environment. And so uh, what I wanted to do is uh, for us together to go over an experiment um, that, that le leverages some of these techniques. So before we get started, I want to go over this post uh, from the Rideshare Guy. So the Rideshare Guy is a very famous blogger in the ride-sharing industry. Um, he essentially writes about like products, feature launches, policies um, that could potentially you know, affect your, rider, your drivers and your, and your, your couriers. And so essentially he claims, so he writes back in 2016, um, can dash cams prevent bad passenger behavior and a big giveaway? So dash cams, especially if you're, if you're in New York, um, drivers have them all over their cars, like in their windshields. And essentially all it is, it has these video recording capabilities in the sense that um, if something were to happen between like rider driver, two riders, uh, even like in case of a traffic violation or if God forbid they were in an accident or whatnot, they would be able to record it, send it over to customer support, and it would just like speed up the entire operation of like resolving that, that dispute. Um, and so what's really interesting here is that like this is, a, this is a hypothetical experiment that we would be able to run, right? Essentially what we would want to be able to see if this is, you know, if this claim is, actual, is actually factual or not is let's measure the impact of dash cams on driver safety. Great. And so you would think, well, okay, this is actually a pretty, could be potentially a pretty classic experiment, right? Where you have, um, you know, let's, why don't we just like give dash cams to 50% of our drivers, no gap dash cams to other 50% of our drivers, and just let the experiment run and see after a certain allotted amount of time, how our incident rate uh, would progress. So here, our success metric or outcome is our incident rate, which is just your number of incidents divided by your number of trips. Multiple reasons we can't do that, which I talked about briefly in like the limitations section of A-B testing, which is, well, first of all, we can't perfectly randomize, right? Um, if this is a countrywide program, um, there are specifically uh, some uh, states that just don't allow for reporting, right? So we have less of a sample um, to be able to split for our treatment and control. Um, and also, it's just like there are there are some heavy legal considerations here, right? Like if we're saying that this is positive, this is a beneficial thing to our driver, and that these ride sharing companies are willing to finance a dash cam, we can't just go ahead and say, well, yeah, some drivers are just not going to be able to get this because, well, it's part of an experiment. So here we essentially need to be able to leverage an additional technique, which in this case is a difference in difference method. And at a very high level, very simplistically, um, cat calls it like a strategic uh, subtraction, and that's all it is. It's a pre-post with some very strict assumptions. Essentially what you're doing is you're looking at your difference in your outcome after your, after your intervention, and you're subtracting that to the difference in incident rate prior to your intervention. So you're just computing, you're just doing two differences. 
you could do multiple in reality. But really, here in this case, you're just doing two um, differences. And essentially, what you get is that, that incremental effect, which would that be your treatment effect. But the biggest thing, um, the biggest thing that's specific to a uh, to a diff and diff is your parallel trends assumption. And all that's saying is that without the without the dash cams program, average driver incident rate would have followed the same evolution as the control group. Right? Um, if we if this parallel tra trends assumption was violated, we would not be able to um, compute that incremental effect. And so visually, this is what it looks like. Right. Um, so this is an excellent post uh, from Columbia um, that their public policy uh, department uh, wrote about. So I highly recommend uh, taking a look. But essentially what you'll see here is that prior to the intervention, you observe a constant difference in outcome. Right. And this is actually something that you're also observing uh, in your post intervention um, by creating this unobserved uh, counterfactual. And so all it's doing is that after the intervention, you're computing this intervention effect. Now, there are two additional assumptions that have to be held in order to, to, in order to uh, apply a diff and diff. So we talked about parallel trends, um, but exchangeability, which is just saying that in the absence of treatment, um, the unobserved differences between treatment and control groups are the same over time, and your stable unit treatment value assumption which is a lot of words to say no interference, right? The units do not interfere with each other and the treatment applied to one unit does not uh, affect the outcome of another unit. So if we go back to this dash cams examples, it's really saying that the fact that the driver uh, did purchase a dash cam, it has no effect on the incident rate of, of another driver, right? These are all independent events. And so once you um, are able to apply all of these assumptions, then you can just re this essentially removes a lot of the, uh, the biases between uh, treatment and control in your post intervention. So great. So intuitively, this makes a lot of sense. Um, so diff and diffs, right? This is a field that this was a method that was originated in econometrics um, for like large scale policy evaluation. So it's very it's very easy to understand. Um, and on top of that, it's even easier to compute. And so. Uh, Essentially, what you're doing is just you're, you're running a regression, right? You're running a regression to be able to estimate this beta three, which is your difference in difference estimator. Um, and so I can go over very quickly what all these uh, coefficients are, um, but it's just a generalized linear model, right? Your beta naught is your intercept. Your beta one measures the time change common to treatment and control. Your beta two measures the difference between treatment and control before the intervention. Um, your beta three, that's the estimator, that's what we're gonna get estimates for, uh, measures the effect of the intervention. Um, and your beta four controls for covariates common to both treatment and control. And then you have your error term. And so now how would we compute this in R? Very simply, you can compute this in, in two lines of code. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm completely exaggerating, but really that's all you're doing, right? You're regressing your outcome variable on this interaction term between your cohort, so your treatment and your post interaction. The one thing that I will say before we go over these, uh, go over these uh, results is that the way that you model your data is very, very critical in being able to get um, estimates for your, different, for your differences and differences. Essentially, you need to mutate it and get, um, so your, uh, uh, cohort indicator. So you need to be able to know which of your users or drivers or whatever were part of your treatment and control prior and post your intervention. Um, but you also need a time indicator. You need to be able to say what happened before and what, what happened after. And so once you run your regression, so, okay, full honesty, right now I just uh, run it as a linear model. Um, an incident rate, that's a count, right? So it would actually be a GLM where you would have to specify your, your family to be your, you know, your plus one distribution. Um, but once you have that, you can then go ahead and look at your coefficients, right? And the one that we're really uh, interested in estimating is this last one, which is the interaction between your treatment and your post. And so here, what we're seeing is that indeed, um, your estimate is, um, is negative 3.2 times whatever, it's not important, um, but it's significant at a level of 0 0.05. And all that's saying is that indeed, um, your intervention, so your introdu introduction of, of dash cams did lead uh, to a decreased incident rate, uh, incident rate, which is very much in line with our um, initial hypothesis. So that's great. Um, so that that is your diff and diff essentially. Like we, it's very highly highly intuitive, um, very easy to compute in R, um, and, and used a lot in large scale um, uh, evaluations.
I think I will I will go over this one additional method just because we have two minutes left. And so um, essentially the, the last one that I will go over is your um, synthetic control. And the only reason that I want to go over it is because, well, first of all, it's very, very much used in, in marketplaces, um, but also um, it's, it's used in rare events, which is really what we're trying to model here. We're trying to understand like the 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 uh, the causal relationship between incident incident rates and other types of interventions and synthetic control is one that, that gets you used pretty often. Um, so um, here, what I'll do is I will uh, show this with a diagram. So let's say you have a affected city, San Francisco, right? So this is where you're introducing your treatment effect. Your synthetic control is essentially you're taking pretreatment characteristics of all of these different cities and just doing a weighted, uh, a weighted average, a weighted combination. Um, and essentially what it's doing is that this, uh, this weighted combination of cities is, is mirroring the treated or affected city prior to the, um, prior to the intervention. And so the constructed control cities are used to estimate what would have happened to the affected cities um, if they were not, you know, if they were not affected by the intervention. So the synthetic control is used to create a counterfactual, which is essentially what all of these methods are, are trying to do. Um, and so uh, once you have your synthetic control, um, it's a very straightforward method. You just compute the difference between the treatment, gr uh, treatment group and the synthetic control in the post-treatment period, um, and then you can get, once again, your treatment effect. Um, I will leave it at here just because um, I think I just wanted to introduce a synthetic control. There are some additional uh, assumptions that I think are very important to this. Um, computationally, you can use actually the um, synth package in R, um, which is really good. To be fully honest, like I was very privileged working at Uber. We had like an incredible experimentation platform that was like created by an army of engineers and data scientists where, you know, if I was essentially looking at a rare event, I had a set of different techniques that I could just use. All I had to do was understand it and then it would be automatically applied. Um, but these methods actually do take a bunch of work and pre-analysis. So specifically here, you want to understand um, what are those pre-treatment uh, characteristics in order to be in order to create um, that weighted combination. Okay, well, um, that is overall a wrap. Um, we went over a lot in 20 minutes, um, but these are just some topics that are very interesting, and I think it's proof that um, you know you might only uh, hear from them specifically in like policies, um, but there's no reason that you can't apply them in, in other industries. Um, I wanted to thank my team um, because I know that they're listening right now, but they also listen to them, uh, listen to this talk on Thursday. Um, so very supportive of the team of data science at Code Academy. Um, and finally, I've linked additional articles here about definitive estimation, synthetic control method. Um, some of my previous coworkers wrote a causal inference uh, article, um, great one. Um, and so I, I just I highly recommend if this is something that you are interested in, um, take a look and um, I'll be around later if you're if you're if you want to chat. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful talk. So, folks, we're here. That's the end of the talks. I don't know. I don't I, that just flew right by.